Hello, my name is Pam Hall, and I'd like to tell you what the Lord has done for me. First, I'll tell you a little bit about me. I had such a wonderful life. The Lord blessed me with a wonderful husband. We've been married 45 years now. I had two children, a boy and a girl. We got saved at a young age. And right off, we just, all we wanted to do was work for God. So we just, we drove the church bus. We took kids back and forth to Sunday school and to youth service, to vacation Bible school, and we were very active in the church. I'm Ronnie Oplinger, a pastor of the Lewis Creek Pentecostal Church, Partridge in Letcher County, and I've been a pastor here uh, for the past 40 years. Pam and Jimmy Hall came to my church in 1986. They had two small children at the time, Jonathan and Heather. And not long after that, uh, Pam and Jimmy took over our bus ministry in the community uh, with our small children in that. And the bus ministry flourished during the time that they drove the bus and brought kids to Sunday school and youth service, the other activities that we had. Uh, they were really a blessing to the church. Life was so blessed and so normal. Then one day, I just woke up in pain in my right arm. From the very beginning, I knew this was different. Felt like something I'd never felt before. So I tolerated it that day, and the following day, I went on to the doctor, a local doctor here in Harlan County. Then my hand began to swell. It would just turn dark looking. It had a dark looking color, and the swelling would get so bad that it would hang down over my hand. And meanwhile, the pain was just getting worse and worse. People was praying. Without that, I don't know how I would have made it. Sister Pam began to get sick, and uh, she was having problems that uh, she went to the doctors, different doctors, and, and she couldn't get uh, a diagnosis. They couldn't figure out what was wrong with her. And she, she would swell her, her arms and hands and her leg would swell her feet. And she, the doctors thought it was rheumatoid arthritis, but uh, that was not what it was. So the pain just kept getting worse. The doctor couldn't diagnose it. He went from one thing to another. It may be this, it may be that. And we kept trying. Meanwhile, our church family and the family and the people around us was praying that God would help and reveal what was going on, that I could get some ease from this pain. But it kept getting worse. It was horrible. My life was just stopped. I couldn't do anything, but I kept pushing. I wanted to still go on the church bus. I couldn't drive. My husband would drive and I would take a pillow and lay under this arm to, to be able to ride the bus to take the kids to church. But it just kept getting worse and worse. So after he tried about a month to help me, he finally decided it must be rheumatoid arthritis. The swelling was huge. My hand was dark and he couldn't figure out what was going on. So he decided he'd send me from there on to Kingsport to a rheumatologist. And when I got there, the old man took one look at my hand and he said, 
I know exactly what this is. He said, I've seen it one time before. He said, rheumatoid arthritis attacks both sides most of the time. And when he saw how swollen my hand was and how it was just in one arm, he said, this is reflex sympathetic dystrophy syndrome. RSD is an older term used to describe uh, CRPS. Both RSD and CRPS are chronic conditions characterized by severe burning pain, most often affecting one of the extremities, the arms, the legs, hands, or the feet. Sister Pam experienced the disease in her arms, hands, feet, and legs. So life just got so bad. I couldn't find any ease. No matter what I'd done, no matter what they gave me, it didn't work. I tried to go on with life. I tried to be part with my family, but I was in so much pain, I couldn't live. The only ease I could get was from heat pads. I would take heat pads and I would roll my arm up in heat pads. It didn't matter if it was 100 degrees outside. I couldn't stand a fan. I couldn't stand the air conditioner. Nothing to blow against my skin. I couldn't even stand a cover to lay on top of it. It was sensitive like a nerve in a tooth is the only way I know how to explain it. So it was, as it got warmer, I laid with electric blankets wrapped up and the sweat rolling, trying to ease the pain. So I went on and when I got to North Carolina, that was when they finally told me that there is no cure. He said, you do understand there's no cure for this. There's nothing we can do. He said, at the end of the road, we'll place a stimulator under your skin and it will help you bear the pain. So I realized even more, I'm in so much trouble. There's no help with this without the hand of God. And that, at that moment, is when I realized it was going to take God and it was going to take His power. God is so good. He helped me so much. And I had good praying people that would pray and they would come by my house after church services. They would come by and they would pray for so long. And different people that heard the kind of pain I was in, they came from Indiana, Ohio. They came out of Hazard. They came people that I'd never seen before and never seen since heard about this and they would come and lay hands on me and pray. All different kinds of churches. It didn't matter who they were. We wanted prayer and we needed prayer. Uh, the church was fasting and praying uh, on a daily basis for Sister Pam. And there was times when this went on 24 hours a day. Somebody was fasting each day. Somebody was praying even through the nights. There was people who took different hours during the nights and uh, would pray uh, and pray for Sister Pam. When we set the surgery, the doctor had never done this before. He said, I'll collapse your right lung. I'll cut and remove three of the sympathetic nerves and he said, it has to stop the pain. So I remember our church family coming. They were there for support from beginning to end. They never left our side, which was such a blessing. And I remember the doctor following me after they did the surgery. And he, he just could not wait for me to wake up. And I remember him running down the hallway to catch me to see if that stopped the pain. 
Well, I remember waking up and the pain was gone. We thought, praise the Lord, this has fixed it. And so I spend it, took them till like the next day to take the tubing out of my lungs. So I spent, you know, some time there in the hospital and the pain never returned. It was, it just stopped. So I came home and we thought it was all over. And then one day I was sitting, looking out my window, what long after the surgery, maybe a week, I can't remember how long it was. And I was sitting, looking out my window and I felt that horrible pain come down again. And when it came back, it came back with vengeance. It was like it was, it was even worse than it ever was. So not only was it in my right arm, I could feel, as they had told me in North Carolina, I could feel it going through my body. It went down into my right leg, and my knee began to swell like my hand. My foot began to turn black. And it was horrible. I couldn't walk. I couldn't use my arm or nothing. And I remember just the support of the people and praying. And it was the only ease I would get. This pain was continual. They gave me narcotics. And I would take those things like every hour. But it didn't phase this pain. It was so out of control it had spread by, by now, it had spread all the way through my body. And it was in my face. It would feel like a toothache, a nerve, a naked nerve, like air was blowing on it. And I'd get muscle spasms in my hands and in my feet and it would draw my hands down and off to the side and sometimes those muscle spasms wouldn't let up for like a whole day at that time i couldn't even feed myself my hair i couldn't comb i couldn't bathe myself my husband would drive the church bus he would come home take the kids on the church bus. Someone would, would get them off and he would come back and give me my bath and he would go back and pick those kids up. That was my fear, was losing my work for God. Surely they won't take this bus away from me, though there was no way they would have done that. But in my mind, that was what I was thinking. That was how much I loved picking up those little kids that never knew anything about the Lord and taking them to church. It was just a wonderful experience. So it got so bad that I was past, I couldn't go. It had been that way for a long time. I couldn't go to church. I couldn't do anything. And all I had was the people that would come in and pray for me. They would cook dishes of food. They would bring. It was just wonderful the way people was. But I was living in agonizing pain. There was times I would just think it'd be so much better if I could just go on home. My kids would get off the bus. They would come in the house. And it was pitiful the way they had to see me in pain. By this time, it had crippled me, put me in a wheelchair. They had to bring a hospital bed in. And what feelings this was all the time this was going on. And this, I feel like I really need to detail this stuff because this is tricks the devil used on me. We can't help our body. We can't help the pain that went on. But he would tell me it's because I didn't have enough faith and that I didn't need to get in a wheelchair because then that meant I didn't have enough faith for God to heal me or help me. So in the beginning, I would make them put me on a quilt and drag me through the house because I thought if I got in the wheelchair... It would keep me from being healed. And 
our pastor called one day and he told me, he said, Pam, if you'd just drop some of that pride, he said, and get in that wheelchair, he said, God will do something for you. So knowing that this was God talking to me, and I didn't want to be stubborn about it, I had them bring the wheelchair on, and it was a horrible feeling sitting in a wheelchair, realizing I'm crippled, it's out of control, I can do nothing. I was always a fix-it person. Anything was wrong, I thought I could fix it. Anything in our life, it didn't matter if I had to stay up day and night, I just fixed it. But this was out of control, and I couldn't fix it. The wheelchair ended up being a great blessing. It was a friend that had had given me that wheelchair to use, and it was motorized. So all I had to do was use one finger to make it go. So it was a blessing. I could get from the living room back to the bedroom in that. And then it went on, and as it got even worse, I had to get a hospital bed. I remember the day they brought this hospital bed and they put it up. I remember turning my face to the wall and crying, just sobbing, because I felt like life was over. There's nothing. I'm miserable. and But all these things become such a blessing, and that's why I wanted to share these things with people. It's not that our faith is weak. If there's something there to help us, we need to just do it and make life easier on our family and on me. So I tried to detail a lot of the stuff. There's no way we could tell you Everything it'd take all day, but and I could never tell you the little details and the way God helped me all the way through this. He never left me. He was always there. When I felt like I was losing my mind, he would come by and help me. And that's his promise to us with these things that he'll never put no more on us than we can bear. And I tell you, I have learned that in life. God has taught me that. I woke up one day like this, and life was over. I mean, it just come to a stop. And that's the way it is. But when God gets ready to fix things, it's the same way. So anyway, it was on a Friday. I remember... And I had a hospital bed in the living room. And at night, I'd get in the wheelchair and I'd go to my bed. And then in the mornings, I'd come back to back in the living room. And I remember it was on a Friday and it had gotten so bad that I couldn't get out of bed. I had not been out of bed. And on Sunday... There was a church group that had come and had church. And all these times, I just waited. In the beginning of this, God had spoke to me through prophecy. And he had told me, he said, I'll move in a miraculous way. And through that prophecy, I kept holding to it. Everybody came, every church group came. Or I'd say, Lord, maybe you'll come by right while I'm here by myself. Maybe you'll come by with that healing virtue and you'll heal my body. But it didn't work that way. It kept getting worse and worse and worse. And I was like this almost two years. Drawing up now in a fetal position in this hospital bed that she's in. And three days before her healing, uh, I told my wife, if the Lord doesn't move, if God doesn't move for Sister Pam, She'll die in a short time. So on Sunday night, 
I remember after the church service, I had a friend, and she would call me from the church, and I would just sort of, she was going through some hard times herself, and we just sort of talked to each other and tried to help each other through the things we were going through in our life. And I remember just crying. I said, I can't stand it no more. It's in my face. It's everywhere. This pain is killing me. I can't get any ease. So I finally went on off to sleep. And the next day then, they tell me that they're going to come by and pray. On December the 30th, 1996, I was at home. It was midday. There was a young minister at home with me that day. His name was Rex Lloyd. He's out of the Hiram community. And Rex was at my house visiting. My phone rang, and uh, Sister Darlene Wharf, I believe it was, uh, told me that she was over at Sister Pam's house and that Pam was extremely sick that day and really needed prayer, and would it be possible uh, for me to come over? And Sister Pam only lives roughly a half a mile from me. So uh, Rex and I drove over to Sister Pam's. Uh, we went in to sit down. There was uh, three uh, other church members there. Three other ladies were there with Sister Pam. And Rex and I sat down, and we only sat down for what seemed like to me a couple of minutes because she was so sick and, and had such great pain, uh, I, I did not want to wait about having prayer for her. We think sometimes because we're not such perfect people that God don't move. But I can tell you that morning when they got there, I was in such pain that I just felt so grouchy and so irritated. Everything was just on my nerves. And I thought often about that, how we try to make ourselves so perfect in life, but there's no way we can. It takes the hand of God to do them things. And God understands. He knows we're human. And so I would feel like if I got hateful or I got grouchy, the Lord wasn't going to heal me. And so that morning when they came, I just remember all that and... They come in, and it was it was my pastor, Brother Ron, and um, Brother Rex Lloyd was from another church. He was he was a, a young preacher, and I remember he was with him. And then they were about three sisters that was there. And I remember when they came, the first thing I would always do when somebody come to see me is I would ask them. If they'd ever been healed, that would be one of my first questions, or if they ever knew anybody that was healed, because I wanted anything that would build my faith or help me know what God could do. So we talked just a few minutes before they got up to pray, and I remember our whole thing, our whole thing we were talking about was about healing. After a couple of minutes of just introductory talking, uh, I said, let's pray. And I started to get up out of the seat that I was in and to move over to the bed where Sister Pam was laying. And when I started to get up out of the seat, the Lord spoke to me and said, I'm going to heal her today. Nobody heard that but me. I was the only person that heard it. They got up to pray, and when they came over to the bed, I remember I was so sick that I couldn't even hardly function. And I remember them just saying over and over and over, just have faith, Pam, just have faith, just have faith. And in my mind, I was thinking, you know, this is just, I just felt like this is just all on me, and I know that sounds silly, but that was really what happened. And I thought, I'm just too sick. I'm too sick to pray. We walked over to the bed, anointed her with oil, began to pray. The Spirit of the Lord come down. And the prayer just continued for maybe 15 to 20 minutes. Just one of those times 
that, that you pray that you never have to think about what you're saying. God is dealing with your heart and, and you're, you're speaking directly to him and you know you are. Meantime, after about 15 to 20 minutes, all of a sudden, the spirit seems to be going away. And Sister Pam is not healed. And in my mind, I questioned the Lord. And I said, Lord, you told me you were going to heal her today. And the Lord spoke right back to me at that very instant and said, tell her to get up. I remember they prayed and prayed and prayed. And just when I thought it was over, they, they just quit. It was like they quit praying. And then all of a sudden, they began to pray again. And when they began to pray, the Spirit of God began to move and just fill that room like a cloud. It just fell in that place. And... Brother Ron looked at me and he said, Pam, he said, I believe you can walk. And when he said that, knowing there's no foolishness in him, I tried to swing my legs off of the side of the bed to, uh, because if he said that, you know, I wanted, that was just the way I was. I was waiting on God to heal me. But when I did and I put my leg off to the side of the bed, it was big, swollen, and black. And I remember thinking it won't work. It was just a thought in my mind the whole time. It was like there was a battle in my mind going on. From where she was sitting in that bed, half sitting, she turned and set her feet on the floor. Sister Darlene Wharf was down in the floor praying. And Sister Pam's foot and leg was purple, almost black. And when her feet touched the floor, Sister Darlene said that the black foot turned back white. And I swung my foot off of the side of that bed. And when I did, I closed my eyes and there was a glass in the door. There was three little glasses. And I remember looking into those glasses and I remember a light coming toward me like I had never seen and he had just come more and more and more into my face and got brighter and brighter. And the next thing I knew, my feet was bouncing on the floor and the Spirit of God was all over me. And just as fast as it came, it was gone. The hand of God had moved. They wouldn't have pain nowhere in my body. And it's 24 years later. And that pain has never come back. So that's what an almighty God we serve. Uh, she was completely healed right at that instant, not just a little bit now and a little bit later or something like that. This was an immediate healing. This woman had been in extreme pain for some two years, almost two years. I had been with her uh, throughout the whole time, uh, daily sometimes, sometimes maybe it'd be a day or two before I'd see her. But any, anyway, I was with her the entire time. And I know for a fact that God healed this woman and she's healed today. That's never been back on her anymore. We moved the, the wheelchair out that day and we took the hospital bed down and put it away. And I went back home and later that afternoon, she called and asked if I could come back over about 3.30 or so, about the time her husband would come in from work. And so I went back over that afternoon and when Jimmy came home from work, he came to the back door she met him at the back door and he said, what's wrong with you? And she said, nothing, Jimmy, I'm healed. And the spirit of the Lord fell again. And we had a wonderful time in the spirit of God. I don't have to ask anybody about this. I personally witnessed it. I went through it with her as her pastor. And this is a true story. And there's nothing about it that's made up. There's just no way to explain this 
to you. When God does something, it was just in an instant. It wasn't over time. In an instant, it was gone just like it came. Amazing. God had told me how amazing it'd be, and it was exactly just like he said it was. It was miraculous. I remember my daughter was home, but my son was gone. My husband was at work when this happened, and I remember when my son came back that evening, the one thing that I had done was told them, take that hospital bed out of here. I don't need this no more. So I remember it was a center man that came in and done that. He took it out and he stored it in the garage. And when my son came back, this is what things will happen to your children during these times. This is things that will carry them through life. And when I'm buried and under the ground, they'll never forget what they seen the hand of God do. He came in, and me not thinking by this time, I had went to take a bath. And, and when he came in and the bed was gone, no one... Because he had trusted God. We all was trusting God to heal me. He came to the door and he hollered and he said, Mom, where's the hospital bed? I said, we moved it because I didn't want to tell him. actually wanted to wait and come out and let him see what God had done. But he went back to the living room. And when he went back to the living room, he saw the wheelchair he come back again, banging on the door. He said, Mom, he said, the wheelchair's in here and you're in there. He said, did you get healed or what? And what a wonderful moment. What a time for my child to remember and my two children to remember what the hand of God had done for me. So I had to tell him. I had to tell him because he had figured out and he was waiting on God to heal me. Everybody was waiting on God to heal me. So then it, my husband came home and I got up and walked to the door to meet my husband. When he came through the door, what? The mighty God we served. The first year after I was healed, I remember about the time I got healed, the Spirit of God, the same thing I had felt that day, would start at the top of my head and go out the soles of my feet. I would feel it get all over me. And it reminded me what God had done. Well, this went on until year after year at the same time this happened. So I got to noticing it was 127 exactly. It didn't matter where I was, what I was doing. If I was in a store or wherever I was, I'd feel that come down over my body. And that same feeling would be there as it was the day I was healed. 24 years later, this year on December the 30th, at 127, it was still doing the same thing. That's one of the most special things God has ever done for me in my life. He always reminds me of where I was and where he's brought me from. This is a miracle to be able to walk with my grandchildren, to be able to hold them in my arms, to be able to just know what I almost missed in life. But what you done, Lord, I praise you for it. I thank you for giving my life back. 
I thank you for letting me stay with my children. I thank you for letting me see my grandchildren. I thank you for healing my body and for allowing me to grow old with my husband. I thank you for letting me tell your word, tell the things what you have done for me. It's you and you only. And at the end of this, I'd like to say it's you, Lord. It's you. It was your hand. It was you and you only and everybody that has Helped. It is a blessing to them because they got to see what God done. I know I wasn't worthy for what you done, God, but you done it, and I praise you, and I'll praise you till the day I die. I'm just thankful that I serve a God who is able to heal what, no matter what the disease is, no matter what's happening, God is still able to heal any disease that happens to come along. 